how did you become an, an exorcist priest? <laughs> <laughs> I'm laughing because I jokingly tell people that I became the exorcist because I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Oh, yeah. So the Archdiocese of Indianapolis has always had a priest as an exorcist. Mm. Even when it fell out of practice after the Second Vatican Council that ended in 1965, Indianapolis has always had a priest in this role. In fact, it was the parish priest where I attended grade school who was the exorcist. And that he passed away in 2005. And my archbishop, who also happened to be my seminary rector when I was in college seminary, became my oh, bishop. So he knew me. Nice. And he said that he was looking for a priest who believed in the reality of evil, but mm -hmm. not one who would believe that everyone who came to me was actually dealing with the forces of evil. Maybe they were having some mental health issue or maybe a physical issue. So he thought that I would be a priest who would be well-balanced in mm. helping people discern whether or not they were truly dealing with the demonic. Oh, what's the process? Do you find immediately? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You know, the, the bishop is the exorcist in every diocese. Yes. He has that authority based on Luke's Gospel in chapter 9 where Jesus sends out the twelve and he gives them authority over every unclean spirit. And we know that the bishops are the successors to the apostles, so that authority resides with them. And then a bishop at his discretion may appoint one or more of his priests to do this ministry mm. in his name. When I was appointed, I became one of only 12 exorcists in the United States. And the church says the best way to learn is through the apprenticeship model yes. to work under a seasoned exorcist. But because there were so few in the United States, which is why my bishop sent me to Rome, and then I was able to connect with uh, Father Carmine de Philippus, the Franciscan priest, who then permitted me to sit in on exorcisms that he performed. Whoa. Wow. So what is your uh, first baptism of fire? I mean, the, your first <laughs> <laughs> encounter you know, Father Carmine was the pastor of St. Lawrence Parish outside the walls of the city of Rome. So every day I would walk down to the Fountain of Trevi if people have ever been to the city of Rome. And then I would catch a bus, take a 15-minute bus ride out to the church. And uh, Father Carmine would have people. There was always about 50 people outside of his office. Some of them had appointments, some did not have one. But they were hoping to be able to speak with him and to have him pray over them. The very first exorcism I witnessed was I was talking with this elderly Italian woman and her husband, and she was telling me why she was possessed. And as I'm talking to her, I'm thinking, there doesn't seem to be anything unusual about this. But Father Carmine walks into the room and he puts a roll of paper towels on the table. He walks back out again. He comes in again and ties a plastic grocery bag onto the wall radiator. He walks back out again, and I'm looking at him out of one corner of my eye, and I'm talking to this lady, and he comes back in again, and he's wearing his Franciscan brown robes, and then he has a purple stole over his neck, the sign of his priestly office. He has the ritual of exorcism in his hand and holy water in the other, and he takes the holy water, and he blesses this lady, and as soon as the drops of water hit her forehead... Her eyes rolled back in her head. She began wow. to cry and foam at the mouth. And then her eyes came back down again. And she's looking at me with this most horrible hatred look. And she begins howling and screaming. And I'm looking at, at this thinking, what in the world has my bishop gotten me into? <laughs> but Father Carmine, he didn't even flinch. He just kept on praying over her the exorcism prayers. Oh, Wow. So, Father, what is the wildest thing you ever seen while doing an exorcism? I did an exorcism uh, a couple years ago here in the state of Indiana, here in the United States. And uh, when the demon manifested, the person's eyes turned green and their pupils became slanted like a serpent. 
And the voice came out of the person's mouth and said, if I told the person that Jesus was going to help them, and the voice said, who's he? He has no power over us. And then later on, when I started to do the exorcism, the demon looked at me and said, you can't get rid of us. We've been here too long and you're not strong enough. And then began to growl and snarl and all those other kind of unusual things. Hmm. When you experience exorcism, how do you process everything? You know, do you feel anxiousness, fear? Or... Early on, yeah, being anxious and fearful. You know, the first time I did an exorcism, I'm thinking, where's the priest who trained me? You know, where can I turn to him? But it's just me now, so I have to rely on what I've learned. But, you know, over the years, I've become more acclimated. Everything that the devil does does not scare me or concern me because I know that the power of God is greater than the power of the devil. In an exorcism, there are many manifestations, and all the manifestations are meant to instill fear such as eyes mm-hmm. rolled in the back of the head, foaming at the mouth, bodily contortions. Mm-hmm. I've done exorcisms where when the demon manifests, the person's body will drop to the floor and begin to slither like a snake. I've seen levitations wow. where bodies will begin to rise up out of the air. The temperature in the room becomes much colder, very horrible stenches and smells. But again, all of these things are ways that the devil is trying to instill fear and to shift the focus away from God in the ritual of exorcism, because the devil is being like a child throwing a temper tantrum who wants all the focus placed on him. Yeah, because the devil is so legalistic. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for that information, Father. If there are a steady flow of Catholics who becoming Protestant, alam nyo ba, ha? Baka hindi nyo to alam, ha? There is a steady flow of Protestant becoming Catholic to defend their faith and love for Jesus. Amen? Alam nyo, itong pinagkaiba ng mga Katolikong lumilipat at nagiging Protestante sa Protestanteng lumilipat para maging Katoliko. Alam nyo ang difference? Yung mga Katolikong umalis, hindi na alam ang simbahan, hindi na alam ang Catholic faith, hindi sila nag-aaral. Mabababaw. At ito mga protestanteng lumilipat ng Catholic faith, mga theologian. Theologian. Parang hindi nyo narinig, theologian po. Para ma-access mo ang buong video talk na ito, be part of my Patreon group. Pili mo lang ang silver member. Makaka-access ka na ng series na ginawa ko, Why Remain Catholic. Okay? And pag ikaw ay naging part ng aking Patreon group, matutulungan mo akong makapag-produce pa ng mga high quality content na katulad na pinapanood mo ngayon. And also, I can evolve to innovate and to hire editors na mas makapag-enhance ng ating mga video blogs at sa mga nagre-request na malagyan uh, ng subtitle ang ating mga blog pag naging part po kayo ng Patreon group malaking tulong po ito para magawa po natin itong online evangelization na ginagawa po natin click nyo lang po yung link na makikita nyo sa baba ng video na to thank you and God bless So that's it. Thank you for watching this video. I hope na na-bless at na-inspire ka dito sa aking vlog. Make sure na i-like mo at mag-comment ka sa baba ng video na to. At mag-subscribe ka sa aking YouTube channel para lagi ka updated sa mga bagong vlog na gagawin ko. At huwag mo din kakalimutan na i-like ang aking page. So this been Adrian Milag encouraging you to live your life to the fullest. God bless you more abundantly.